Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. In early March 2021, the Biden administration released its interim national security strategic guidance, a so-called skinny version of its national security strategy. The speed at that time was noteworthy and not accidental. As President Biden concluded his introductory letter to that document, quote, we have no time to waste. The simple truth is America cannot afford to be absent any longer on the world stage. And under the Biden-Harris administration, America is back. Diplomacy is back. Alliances are back. But we are not looking back. We are looking irrevocably toward the future and all that we can achieve for the American people together. Such bold words promised bold action, but did not speed the production of a full, fat national security strategy. The continuing challenge of COVID-19, the collapse of Afghanistan, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine each delayed the completion of the national security strategy. Now, more than a year and a half later, and just in time for the midterm elections, the full NSS has been released. It's a little more than twice as long as the skinny version, though the message sounds familiar. The world is at an inflection point. Quote, the post-Cold War order is definitively over and a competition is underway between the major powers to shape what comes next, close quote. Democracy and autocracy are at odds, and, quote, the need for a strong and purposeful American role in the world has never been greater, close quote. To meet this challenge, the administration promises both to protect American interests and build on alliances, both to pursue great power competition and encourage cooperation to meet shared challenges, to break down the dividing line between foreign policy and domestic policy, while also avoiding the temptation to see the world solely through the prism of strategic competition to build an inclusive world. That's not just a tall order. It's an entire menu of tall orders. So what does this document tell us about the Biden administration's plans? How have those plans changed over the last two years? What, if any, insight can it offer about how to respond to enduring and unexpected challenges? To help us better understand the content and context of the NSS, we are delighted to have with us two colleagues who study questions of policy planning and civil military relations, Dr. Carrie Lee and Colonel J.P. Clark. Carrie A. Lee is an associate professor at the U.S. Army War College, where she serves as the chair of the Department of National Security and Strategy and as co-director of the U.S. Army War College Center on Civil Military Relations. She received her Ph.D. in political science from Stanford University and a B.S. from MIT. Colonel J.P. Clark is an Army War College professor in the Department of Military Strategy, Planning, and Operations, as well as the editor-in-chief of The War Room. His previous assignment was in the Pentagon, where he was the chief of the strategy division in the Army staff. So I'm feeling a little nervous because these are essentially both of my bosses in front of me today, but welcome to A Better Peace, both of you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So great to actually be here in person rather than uh, than, than talking virtually. So it's a, it's good to be it's, it's a whole new world. Indeed. So I want to start a question for both of you, but Carrie, I'm going to throw it to you first. What's the purpose of publishing a national security strategy and why do we do it? So national security strategic documents like the NSS, they serve two purposes. The first is as a signaling device, both to domestic and international audiences. And then they also provide strategic direction to the rest of the bureaucracy that is the executive branch of government. And documents like the NSS really, uh, they, they provide signals to the domestic public about the administration's priorities, about what they can expect the focus to be on, and what the administration really values when it comes to their foreign policy priorities. 
from an international signaling perspective. They're looking at allies and trying to signal to allies about their commitment to uh, different values and where their priorities are going to be, as well as potential adversaries about what they what they should be on notice about mm -hmm. and where the administration is going to focus its time and efforts. Uh, from a strategic direction uh, perspective, documents like the National Security Strategy will then provide the basis on which every other bureaucracy nests its strategic direction. Mm -hmm. So this is really the foundation of where the rest of the government is going to go. And they will, especially within the national security apparatus and uh, any any institution that deals with foreign affairs. Great. JP, you actually worked in a strategy office. And so uh, uh, as we we're both we're, and we're here sitting in the headquarters of the Department of National Security and Strategy. So what is your experience with these documents and, the, and how they work yeah. for the Army? You know, and, and, and Kerry really hit it uh, on the head that and. Any of these documents, uh, whether it be a service strategy, because uh, we were we, we put forward some plans about how we would do an army strategy, did not end up uh, actually executing that, or all the way up to the White House's national security strategy, uh, has those dual purposes. There are some ways that you know one of the key decisions to make early on is whether it's going to be a classified or unclassified, and you know usually there's a, a mixture of both. Uh, as one of the senior leaders in the Pentagon, in reference to the national defense strategy, which is a classified document in contrast to this released in March, um, you know, the senior leader said, you know, what, what's, the, what's the value of these things that we can't even be honest with ourselves in a classified, you know, document? Uh, and so there's a certain aspect, although there's a third uh, element, and this is kind of goes to answering your question that I would, would throw out there. Uh, it tends not to be the way that most senior leaders view these, but actually I think it's actually the most important of at times of uncertainty – and there are different, you know, viewpoints. And so from the White House's perspective, differences in, in terms of, you know, how we, we navigate certain tensions of, in, of interests or threats between different departments of, of the government, the process of producing these documents is, I think, almost more important than the document itself. And that it's, you know, forcing uh, leaders and forcing their organizations to have conversations about uh, how we rack and stack these these sorts of, uh, uh, you know, interests and threats. And so even if there's not necessarily going to be a definitive answer, because often, uh, you know, no, no good statesman wants to make a decision before he or she has to. They like to, you know, put it off until you come to a moment of crisis um, before, you know, definitively putting your, um, your, your chips down on the table. Uh, the fact that state... Defense, Commerce, Treasury, the White House, NSC, everybody has been talking about these things provides a good uh, foundation for reacting to crises uh, and, and events as they develop. And so I think, for me, the process is more, impart, more important than the, the output of the document. See, that's, that's a, a great question that I would throw back to you then, Carrie, is if the idea is it's about bringing all the stakeholders together to talk about what we want to do, we as the United States of America. But if a, if strategy is supposed to be balancing ends, ways, and means, as we talk about here at the War College, that suggests making choices. And yet, if you want to make sure everybody is heard from in a document, often you don't make choices, or at least it's it's more about cake and pie than it is about deciding one or the other. How should we make sense of the of the the choices that this document? suggests the United States is going to make. So I appreciate JP's understanding of, of the NSS, the, the famous Eisenhower quote, where plans are nothing and planning is everything. Uh, so I, I want to say I think that's that's absolutely right on. How well does the document set priorities? Um, to me, I don't look at a national security strategy and think that this is a strategy document in the way that we think about marrying ends, ways, and means. I think of the NSS as a grand strategy document. And so my two kind of favorite definitions of grand strategy are come from Barry Posen, which is a grand strategy is a state's theory of security for itself, or uh, Nina Silov's um, definition, which is it's a a state's grand principles, grand plans, and grand behaviors. Mm -hmm. So as we think about it from a much more holistic sense, 
I think this document does a very good job of giving the United States or the Biden administration's sort of theory of security about what keeps the United States safe. And that then provides the guiding light from which, as you develop more conventional strategies, um, what those, you know, the marrying between ways and ends, um, as we think about our political ends and what keeps what we think of is is necessary for security. How do we translate that into ways and how do we get there? This document gives you a pretty good idea about what should be informing those ways. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's, that's an excellent way to put it. That, that helps to to explain, right? Because there has been some criticism in the initial readings of this document that it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't place, it doesn't rank order priorities. But if you're, what you're saying is, is that a document like this isn't designed to rank order priorities. It's it's designed to let us know what all the priorities are. I would agree with that. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. Um. So we had the initial, the skinny version, a year and a half ago. And now we have this one. Uh, based on your readings, your both our memories of the previous document, our readings of this one, how has how does this document either change, develop, or reflect the priorities of the first one? I'll go to you two first, JP, and then to Kerry on this. Yes, uh, and so uh, the what I found interesting in, in looking over this document is that there was, you know, this, the transition for this administration was very, very well organized. And, and you'd hit it in your introduction that, you know, they were able to, to put out the, you know, the, the quote unquote skinny guidance very, very quickly uh, because they had, they had already, you know, gotten started. And so the fact that there was such a delay uh, was uh, not simply because these are a bunch of procrastinators or people who are uninterested in, you know, documents, but that it was a, a very deliberate decision as all of the different events that you had you had mentioned were unfolding. And so I was a little surprised at actually how little change had been, you know, uh, uh, there was between the two. Now, that's not necessarily uh, a criticism. Um, I think that one thing that we should keep in mind is that a lot of folks who are involved in this administration were there for the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review, uh, which was, uh, you know, famously, you know, just as the, the Crimean invasion or the Russian invasion of Crimea was going on, um, you know, it basically prompted a very quick rewrite. And so they were, uh, you know, justifiably cautious about producing something that was going to become immediately overtaken by events. Uh, so it wasn't that, you know, this is not a sign of necessarily of, of dithering, uh, but, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of continuities. Uh, and I think the one that's most striking, although I, th from all reporting, I have no you know personal insights to this. The one in, in light of a lot of the criticism of uh, the president in terms of the, the recent Saudi Arabia trip, uh, you know, there's still this very strong element of, of you know, democracies versus autocracies, which I think just shows that it, it truly reflects, uh, once again, according to reporting, uh, the way that he, he views the world. And so is, is a true, you know, this is not a, a staff product of people who want to try to convince the president of something, this reflects uh, 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 his view, which is ultimately what makes some of these documents, uh, you know, more powerful. The other example of that was, you know, the twenty thousand, the twenty eighteen national defense strategy, uh, which once again, whether you you liked it or or didn't or did not, it really reflected Secretary Mattis's view of the world, and so it was a very powerful document as opposed to some of these, which uh, find their way very quickly into uh, you know the, the the coffee table and the antechamber and are never looked at again. That's fair, Carrie. What do you think of the difference between uh, the the previous version and this one? Uh, I generally agree with JP that it that there's much more continuity than than any kind of difference. the The big difference that I read uh, much more emphasis on Russia for, I think, obvious reasons. Right. The Biden administration was, I think, when they entered office, ready to relegate Russia to declining power who, you know, needs to be contained. But the focus was much more on the liberal international order and how are we going to deal with rising China. Russia makes its way into the document. I don't have the word count in front of me, but a lot. A lot. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's that's an official an official characterization <laughs> yes right? a lot yes and so 
that was that was kind of the major change where, again, being overtaken by events, you have to address the elephant in the room that is the major war in Eastern Europe going on right now and the threat that Russia presents to that region. Right. Well, I the the, the phrase that really struck me is even in the skinny version, right, the emphasis on democracy at home. And so the, the struggle between democracy and authoritarianism is both a, a domestic and an international response. And when the in the in opening of the Biden administration, this was clearly a reaction to the previous administration. Um, and and in this version, right, there is that phrase that I mentioned in the opening that um, the, uh, the literal quote, right, the desire to uh, to break down the difference between domestic and and international domestic policy and international politics right break down the dividing line between foreign policy and domestic policy um, this strikes me as a as as a as a complicated thing to bring out in a national security strategy right because it's you know it, critics could say that it 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 threatens to inject partisanship you know where is the concept of foreign policy ending at the water's edge but defenders of it could say we have seen the role of international actors in attempting to influence American domestic politics. And so we should see these things as uh, intimately bound up. But how can we imagine a national security strategy if it's, if it's both a matter of sort of emphasizing the, the relationship between domestic and foreign policy and an international struggle between, uh, between democracy and authoritarianism? Uh, is it possible to do both of those things in a national strategy? Um, uh, and especially if one has to say, in order to stabilize domestic politics, you have to keep oil prices low. So you might actually have to be friendly to states that are not necessarily democracies. Um, how do we manage those kinds of trade-offs? It's a, it's a big question. I'm going to go to you, two for, you first, JP. Well, and, and that's uh, uh, you, you've kind of driven to the heart of it. And this, I think, is partly reflects the national security communities struggle since the end of the Cold War in that we're talking about documents that are inherently about managing tensions between a lot of competing um, uh, interests uh, and threats that are very finely balanced that are going to be contextual. And so there's not going to be a single answer that, you know, domestic politics always trumps, you know, foreign policy or, or, or whatever the case might be. Um, and so it, this is more outlining all of the things that, that are in play at, at the top tier of the table of interest, and then they'll have to be made a, a, as events develop and, and I, on a case-by-case -case basis and, and things like, you know, budgets, where you're talking about, you know, you're not zeroing out any one, you know, element, but it's, you know, 10 million more here, 10 million less there, uh, as, as the case might be. And... Uh, I think that there was some very interesting, nuanced changes because, you know, Kerry had hit it, you know, that absolutely the, the big change is, is Russia. And so some places where you see that, uh, um, there actually is a explicit mention of industrial policy, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting. Not that we haven't been doing industrial policy for a long time. It's never been a, you know, on-off switch. It's always been, uh, you know, a a nuanced sort of aspect, but um, that's just not something that you know we would have said out loud uh, that long ago. Uh, and then also, I think that the one of the bigger changes is now uh, one of the um, challenges that they talk about the transnational challenges, climate and energy security. Mm -hmm. And right there, you know, there's nothing that brings out the tensions between the foreign policy and domestic, uh, you know, and, and non geopolitical interests better than trying to manage that over this, you know, potentially very bleak uh, winter in Europe and around the world as, as we're feeling the, the, the crunch of energy coming off of both uh, Ukraine and then also the OPEC decision. And so that's just, you know, one example of, of these, you know, these small nuances. The, the other one I would say that came out of Ukraine is that there's been some slight change in the way that they've talked about the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a little bit more, 
uh, open to militarization, which a year ago was something that was definitely not on the table. And uh, although it's kind of funny as we get into these really, you know, slight nuances and changes, uh, although the world might be divided between, you know, democracies and authoritarian governments, this looks a whole lot like the, uh, you know, the the Chinese Communist Party Congress, you know, parsing of, uh, you know, the old Kremlinology of very, very, you know, fine, nuanced, you know, okay, what, do, what is this comma now mean in these sorts of things. I'm sure that uh, in Beijing and Moscow, they are they're doing that right now, just as, as we are with uh, President Xi's uh, recent address. I imagine they are, right? And, and that's going back to carry your initial point, these are public documents, right? Therefore, they're to, uh, I guess, in some ways to calm the domestic audience and to warn up possible competitors. But um, and, and I did notice, right, that, that the Arctic gets a whole section of its own regionally, which I don't think it got in the is certainly in the skinny version. But Kerry, what about this connection between domestic and and foreign policy and the the talk about an inclusive society uh, that this comes out a lot in the discussion as well? So I would actually argue that while the specifics and how the Biden administration is looking at the rel- the relationship between certain dom- certain domestic elements, and foreign policy is new. Mm-hmm. Historically, it's not uncommon for uh, U.S. leaders to see domestic policy and international policy as intertwined. Um, so you go back to the Cold War, speaking of the Cold War, many of the arguments for the civil rights movement were made because the U.S. was competing globally against other regimes. And that was a cudgel that adversaries in the Soviet Union used to use against the United States about you talk about freedom and you talk about democracy, and yet you treat your citizens at home very badly. And that was a big argument in favor of civil rights. So the intersection between domestic politics and domestic policy and international politics is not so unusual. Um, Even the Trump administration had an entire section of its NSS on the economy. Um, It used the phrase American values 34 times. So there was quite a bit and there was a, a lot on border security. So the intersection between domestic and international, I think, is a lot fuzzier than uh, and historically fuzzier than what we might think, even as the Biden administration is explicit about fixing U.S. democracy and inclusivity, public investment in the economy, uh, whereas, you know, we traditionally saw free markets as a as a source of strength. Um, and then the, the phrase that really struck me was trade as being fair to Americans. So international trade policy really shaped now in a way that uh, deals with domestic political concerns uh, increasingly. Right. Well, and that gets the, the, the reference to industrial policy. Um, the, the fact that, we, that the document talks about China and Russia, but goes out of its way to emphasize that China has, a connections, has connections with the United States and our allies that Russia does not uh, is an interesting point. Um, one of the issues that was true in the skinny version and is true in this one is the Biden administration has emphasized the need to um, revitalize our alliances and our partnerships. And that, of course, raises the question of what do you do if you want to uh, you want to improve alliances? But what if our allies don't do what we want to want them to do? Um, and so how would you say and I'll start with you, Carrie, how would you say the uh, events over the past six months to a year, um, have indicate have have shown the Biden administration's approach to dealing with allies and partners. And do you see that? Do you recognize that from this document? So absolutely. And in many cases, this document is largely a summary of what the Biden administration has been doing, and they're pretty explicit about that. I think part of alliances, though, is is about give and take. And so you are doing things that you don't necessarily want to do in the service of addressing a common overarching security interest. Um, Where the Biden administration departed from uh, the Trump administration, though, is that it increasingly sees a role where the U.S. needs to give as well. And so in revitalizing those alliances, the United States is sharing intel. They've laid off of the 2% demands on NATO. They've... Uh, They've given quite a bit in addition to expecting European allies to give up a tremendous amount of energy security and uh, other 
you know, inflation and, and other economic costs in order to address the Russia situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. JP, what about allies and partners? Um, and connected to this, something that I've, uh, there's a, there's a, a, you know, uh, from whenever you assign a document, right, students will flip through it and they will find the, the text boxes that are blown out. And there's a full page text box on integrated deterrence. And so I got to ask you, What's integrated deterrence? How does it relate to both the national strategy of the Biden administration, but also do alliances and partnerships have an issue with that as well? Wow, thank you. Uh, and so a little bit of background for, although I imagine many of our listeners will, will already know this. And so integrated deterrence is actually borrowed from the national defense strategy. And so it's something that... Um, uh, through some of my experiences in the, in the Pentagon, I had a chance to know is, 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 is truly how Secretary Austin uh, sees the world. And I think there's a, a little bit of, of a, um, so it's slightly unfortunate in the sense that there's a, there's a big idea there um, by using the term deterrence, unfortunately, and with, you know, two colleagues from, you know, uh, our, our Dinas here who teach the theory of, of, of war and strategy, you know, clearly deterrence has a good seven or eight decades worth of, 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 of deep um, scholarly, you know, discussion and, and you know, shelling and pape and, and, and all of the, you know, the greats within that realm. And so I don't think that we should understand this too narrowly within, you know, that very well-established corpus of scholarship. Uh, instead, integrated deterrence uh, in some ways is about uh, and this has, you know, been been reported in, in a lot of open sources. You know, there there are some significant problems, particularly when we talk about China and the Western Pacific, uh, and various uh, places where they could go. And and so, in classic, you know, a business school fashion, if you can't quite solve the problem in the way that you want to, then you just try to make it bigger. And so, <laughs> rather than making this a pure attritional operational, you know, uh, you know, slugfest. Which even if we win, it's a pyrrhic victory against a nuclear armed adversary of, of you know roughly equal economic heft and much greater population. It's let's make the problem bigger by using uh, space and cyber, other domains more effectively. Let's make the problem bigger by having uh, a, a better in integration across the, uh, the the whole of government. And then to your question, let's also make it bigger by uh, having more sophisticated, nuanced, um, uh, I won't say use of allies and partners, because we kind of hit this, that it's not, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, 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 a understanding that they have their own interests. And uh, depending, particularly with China, there's a lot of, of, of overlap. And one thing that this, this document notes is in a lot of cases, you know, these allies and partners are saying again and again, don't make us choose between the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, but if we if we look for places where our interests do come together or that we can uh, complicate the problem by having uh, overlapping interests of allies, partners, whatever the case might be, uh, then that becomes very difficult for uh, China poten to potentially exploit cleavages uh, because it all just becomes such a mess. And this is kind of, to me, it's kind of reminiscent of NATO nuclear strategy during the Cold War when you have force to frap and you have you know the you know the uh, you know the UK deterrent. Um, everything is it just becomes too too hard of a problem for some force planners, and so hopefully that that builds restraint. And so the big idea is just to make the problem a little bit bigger, and it's not purely an operational military slugfest. Mm -hmm. And to bring everybody into it, uh, Carrie, as we we as we approach the end here, I want to ask you if you have anything else to add on on integrated deterrence. But I also wanted to give you uh, a chance to say, was there anything in this document that you saw that surprised you? I'm so glad that you asked that. Uh, so one of the things that was most surprising to me as a scholar of civil military relations was that civilian control of the military got a mention in the national security strategy. And I'm pretty sure that that's a first. So the NSS says we will maintain our foundational principle of civilian control of the military, recognizing that healthy civil military relations rooted in mutual respect are essential to military effectiveness. Uh, that is a fascinating and very interesting inclusion that suggests that 
the Biden administration really feels there's something to fix there. And I think with the recent open letter in War on the Rocks and other commentary that's been provided, that's a, it's a fair assessment. And so thinking through what effective civil military relations look like in the 21st century when you have increasingly the intersection of domestic politics and international relations and national security and domestic security and uh, new technologies that challenge and increasingly automate kind of human decision making away like artificial intelligence. There's a lot that's challenging how we think about civil military relations right now. And so the Biden administration is thinking about that. They're cognizant of it. Obviously, we also have, you know, the the next sentences in that deal with diversity and inclusion, suicide prevention, sexual assault, harassment, and other forms of violence, abuse, and discrimination. It's recognizing that the military has a problem with recruiting and retention, that it might not be the force that we need in 2040 or 2050. And so how do you create the force that you need that is going to be effective in the national security problems that you need to address over the next 20 years? Because that any strategy, as much as Biden talks about America being back, President Biden says that, right, that we're also talking about planning going forward. So we are just about out of time. But uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. J.P. Clark, Kerry Lee, thank you so much for joining us here on A Better Peace to talk about the national security strategy. And I'm going to warn you that um, as we watch this strategy be put into place in the time to come, we are probably going to have you back to talk about it some more. So keep your schedules flexible and your deterrence integrated. So thank you, Carrie Lee. Thank you, J.P. Clark. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all the programs and send us your suggestions for future programs. We're always interested in hearing from you. Please subscribe to A Better Peace. And if you haven't subscribed to A Better Peace yet, I hope that you will take some time to reflect on your life choices. But after you have subscribed to A Better Peace, please rate and review this podcast on your podcatcher of choice. We are always interested in broadening the community for conversations like this one. And even though this conversation is over, we look forward to welcoming you next time. And so until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day. Thank you.